You must have seen his iconic photos, especially one with James Dean. But did you have any knowledge of Danny Stock before you made the film? No, and I, and when I started looking at, I mean, a lot of his photos, even of like uh, his photos of hippies and stuff, that they're so famous. And I had like for some reason Dennis Stock, it just I, it, it, even when you ask photographers about him, his name is just not that famous, um, which is incredible considering how famous his work is. Uh, but yeah, I haven't I hadn't heard of him before. Do you, I mean, did you study him a lot? Do you think it was necessary to get to know him that way, or did you want to sort of create him just from scratch, make him your Dennis Stock? Um, I mean, to be honest, there was this one video which Anton's. Anton's friend had made a documentary about Dennis Stock and there was he interviewed him and they just gave me the uncut version of this interview and I watched it so many times because it, it was in between the takes they had he didn't stop recording and it was uh, how Dennis was reacting to the guy who was interviewing him he was so rude and just like so it was just astonishing like how like <laughs> and the guy was being so nice to him and I learned a lot from that. Like there was, because I think Dennis really harbored these resentments that he had when the movie set and took for his entire life. And I talked to his son Rodney about it as well. Like you know, he was a very kind of he had all so many so many, he had a massive chip on his shoulder about stuff, and uh, I thought it was quite interesting. When you play someone who's uh, lived, I mean, does it? Uh put more of a, a responsibility on your shoulders, do you think? Or can you just go about it as uh, with any part? Um, uh, some, yeah, in some ways, I mean, I definitely felt more responsibility after I'd met his son. Because um, uh, he had a very, it was very raw to his son still, their relationship. And I, I didn't want to just, you know, fake some kind of happy ending or anything. I just thought that's kind of cruel. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, at the end, of, at the end of the day, you are interpreting it like however you want. You know, I mean, it's how, whatever you find interesting in the story, really. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you do have some kind of responsibility. What What is it that you thought was interesting in the story that that made you want to do it? I mean, I just connected. There's some. There's, there's a strange kind of parallel, I think, in some ways between photography and acting and that kind of career where you're totally dependent. Well, the Dennis Stock's kind of photography where you're taking photos of famous people, basically. Um, or, uh, I don't know, just, when you're taking photos of people, you know, interesting, you know, like, he's not always taking photos of landscapes, for instance. Um, you know, an actor, you're dependent on the material and the, the opportunity to act and how frustrating that is. Um, and I think it was quite interesting to explore that in Dennis. And also there's another part of Dennis where he felt he was so inhibited um, that it, it actually inhibited his work as well, his inhibitions as a person. And I kind of related to that a little bit. Uh, some photographer friends of mine are very sensitive to how... Uh, People who play photographers on films treat the camera. Mm -hmm. How did you How did you go about? Because Anton said he gave you one to so sort of the camera becomes uh, part of your body almost. Yeah, um, yeah. I had I the Leica which I have in the movie. I was using that a lot. And you do if you if you're walking around and you have. I mean, I basically took it around everywhere for about three months before. Um, it does. It, it's a strange uh, thing that happens. You kind of. For one thing, you become incredibly protective of it, mainly because it was so expensive, <laughs> and I kept thinking I was going to lose it all the time. Um, but it also gives you a, it gives you a kind of strange power trip. You you, you have purpose walking into anywhere in, in the world, and I sort of understood why Dennis was. You, know, you can see in the photos of him. You know he he loved that you know that power when you can cover your face and take from the subject. Um, but they have to be open to you, and I think you really enjoyed that. And also, photography is still so important. I mean, I mean that, that uh, a, f a photographer says more than a thousand words. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it still goes really. Definitely, especially now when people can barely read. But it says about a billion words. <laughs> um, 
No, but also we've seen all the photographers that change uh, sort of the course of the world. Sometimes you have a mm-hmm. stills photography, and that causes uh, people to react politically all over the world. Definitely, and even it's interesting what causes such a massive thing as well. Because I mean, the, in this story, the the James Dean photographs have probably been seen by more people than James Dean's movies, and and people will look at the photographs, and it's like they're so brainwashed and because basically that the, the the moody new star thing which Dennis Stock took is it's a PR campaign from, with the studio saying like that's how they wanted to promote him and it just worked so well that like a whole generation of kids are saying like I'm conflicted too like I'm not like my parents I want to be something different and this is the face of it but it was completely manipulated I mean it was like um, and people still connect to those photos now, and it re- still represents a certain element of disaffected youth, which is crazy because he was just—I mean, literally just taking a photo of some guy walking down the street. <laughs> and there's nothing else to it. <laughs> like, and, and it was a cool photo. And there's the mood in that photo. That is it. Yeah, definitely. That's why I kind of—that's why I love when we were shooting that. It's just such an—it's so odd. Like, I mean, because you can't. How could he possibly have thought? That, that that would happen afterwards. Mm. I mean, ever in a million years. Um, what did James Dean mean to you? Did he mean anything for you as an actor while you, when you started in the business? Really? Um, I mean, really, I didn't connect to him like Dane connected to him. I mean, I, I, I definitely had a period where I was, thought he was really... I always just thought he was like kind of cool. I never had a, a, a much deeper connection to it. I mean, I mean, but I liked him as like a stylist. Uh, you know, he things about camera technique and just sort of, you know, how you could get a certain tone by through you know your body language and stuff. Um, but I don't know. I, I never, I never really had a particularly deep connection with him though. Not like Dane then. Who had to, yeah, Dane really worshipped him. Yeah, like really, really meant something to Dane. Uh, what, what do you think that among the comparisons of between the film industry and then in the seventies, uh, sorry, in the fifties and today, do you think uh, has not changed the way they, the industry treated James Dean and the way they treat uh, young actors today? I mean, I think it was kind of breaking apart then, right when I think Dean basically broke <laughs> the, you know, how actors before that were were treated because he was sort of impossible, just impossible to contain, and then all the other actors wanted to imitate James Dean afterwards. Um, but I think people can still you can still get caught you're not officially contracted to a studio but um, you can get blacklisted just as easily I mean if you piss off the wrong person you're done immediately it's still the industry is still controlled by very very few people um, and uh, yeah you have to kind of you have to play the game do you try, consciously try after the Twilight experience the goal sort of to find really other parts that, that uh, sort of independent films like this, etc. No, I mean, just just the only things that have appealed to me, really. I mean, uh, it's not too much of a conscious decision. I mean, I try and do, I try not to repeat myself. I mean, and that's it, really. But if I found a really cool thing which was quite similar to something I'd already done, I'd probably do that anyway. <laughs> Is that like, I mean, do you like, do you want to be challenged when you look for a new part? Um, yeah, and I, I kind of, you know, you hope that doing something will allow you to to learn something new about yourself and, and uh, you know, see where your boundaries are, see, so you, you know, and hopefully make you more confident and, uh, and bring something into your, into your reality afterwards. Can you use what happened, I mean, the Twilight experience, to use that to get part? I mean, you're very well, well known after that. You, you can get through the right doors to talk to people if you're interested in something. I mean, definitely to talk to people, but like, really, the people who I want to work with, they don't just hire you for, for the wrong reasons. I mean, at, at least I mean, you can tell when someone's hiring you or someone's offering you a job when they don't really want to offer you the job. And I wouldn't work with them anyway, unless I, I mean, I guess unless you really want to. But it doesn't happen very often anyway, like that. So how can you tell that? You can just tell in the tone. I mean. And, and it's also it's one of the most depressing things ever if you like someone and, and, and they're just like yeah well if you want to do it you can do it and it's like uh, I don't want to do it then 
<laughs> Has the Twilight Hysteria sort of toned down a little bit for you now? Um, yeah. Well, it's weird. And so either I've gotten older and I kind of just don't see it as much. Um, or I just live a slightly different life. I go to different places. I mean, still, if you go to... If you go to uh, I don't know, like... I don't know, it's just quite random places. It, it, it kind of, it can really spark off a bit of mayhem still. I think I'm just better at dealing with it now. Mm. I heard a story about you being on an airplane with 14 Danish uh, teenagers. <laughs> yeah, on the way back from Budapest. <laughs> I couldn't really believe that. The Danish hockey team. <laughs> you're, go, you're doing it. Have you, have, have you done this sh- uh, shy little leader yet, or are you going to do it? Yeah, yeah just finished. It sounds very interesting. I think it's going to be really good. It's a kind of... That's why I was thinking this this year, everything I'm trying to do is, like, really... I mean, extremely challenging to an audience. Um, you know, they're kind of... But, like, not inaccessible, but just... Uh, it's like... I mean, Childhood of a Leader is basically a strange kind of thriller... But um, it's a or like a horror movie. But it's it's about. But there's nothing supernatural particularly about it, and it's a it's a seven year old boy who's the, the lead. Um, but uh, I don't know. Brady has just got a great tone on it. I've never seen anything like it. And the soundtrack's going to be amazing. It's incredibly beautifully shot and stuff. And the beard for that's for a film shooting right now, is it? Uh, that was for Child of a Leader. I Did literally you? finished like two days ago. Yeah, we see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you located in uh, America or England now? Or is, there, is it between both? It's sort of between both, yeah. I've been in London for a, for a few months. I'm going back to LA in a few weeks, I think. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks.